Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. America hangs in the balance. Established on the ideals and principles of Christianity, the world now looks on as America, the once glorious beacon on the hill, shed its dependency on God. The once unwavering allegiance to the self-evident truths of God is now considered a nuisance to America's progress. In fact, if America breaks away from its Christian heritage, the future of our great nation will undoubtedly end. Yet, there is hope. There is still a window of opportunity to reignite, reignite our country's fervor, to bring peace and regain stability once again in America. But it will, it, require, it will require something, something more than what the majority of Americans are willing to give. Americans must be willing to take a stand on behalf of our freedoms. The time to stand up for biblical truth is now. In fact, we argue that the posterity of the Christian faith depends on it. If you care about America and the future impact Christianity will have on generations to come, then it's time to stand strong for America. Jason Jimenez is the founder of Stand Strong Ministries and faculty member at Summit Ministries. He's a pastor, apologist, and national speaker. He's the author of The Raging War of Ideas, How to Take Back Our Faith, Family, and Country, and the Bible answers to 100 of life's biggest questions. In 2018, Jason launched I Will Stand Strong, an online global movement impacting thousands of young people with the gospel. You can find out more at standstrongministries.org. Joining us now to talk about his new, book, his new book, Stand Strong America, Courage, Freedom, and Hope for Tomorrow is Jason Jimenez. Jason, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. It's an honor to be back with you, Rabbi. I appreciate you and your invitation. Well, we are blessed to have you, and I think that this is, um, <clears throat> as I said, we just wrapped up an hour-long interview with Dr. Michael Brown on his new book, uh, Rewrite of Revolution, which he released 20 years ago and has now updated it, and calling for revolution at the personal level that we are to take back America and Christianity one believer at a time in igniting our own faith and then making it contagious and not have to launch an organized, large uh, headship and leadership, but to do it at the individual level the way that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two and mm -hmm. to change the world that way. Uh, you stand strong in that same belief that we have allowed our faith to drift and our silence is deafening and the majority are being ruled by the minority and we're being overrun and we've lost precious ground <clears throat> and <clears throat> Our heritage, our foundation, uh, it's like the termites have started eating at that deep, deep, deep level to undermine the underpinning of America, and you have had enough. Well, yeah, I would say had enough of seeing, I'd say mainly, Rabbi Eric, people who don't take their faith seriously who are apathetic, or in some cases, narcissistic. And that seems to be a growing trend these days. And both of those things are not biblical at all. I mean, if we're gonna be reinforcing biblical truth, as you see modeled you know, within the prophets and the apostles in the New Testament, you see courage. And you know, courage um, is not without fear. To be courageous, you have to face the fear. But you have the faith and knowing that the object of what your faith is in is far stronger and greater and more powerful than the, the fear that consumes us oftentimes. And so that's when you see, again, Paul, many times boldly proclaiming the gospel and, and even telling the church to pray for him that he may be courageous when he's about to go someplace to speak to a particular audience. And so I think that when we say that we've had enough, we'd say, listen, Christians, the fruit that we're not bearing is having significant results not just in our culture, but let's take a step back in our homes. You know, the, the reflection of what we're seeing taking place in churches today, no matter the denomination, I, again, within the framework of a, a Christian understanding of who God is, sending his son, 
what salvation is by grace through faith that we are saved and knowing the, that the Bible is the infallible word of God and that we are waiting for the return of Christ, those doctrinal tenets that we're not to compromise in, but churches and, de and denominations that embrace those doctrinal teachings, it's time for us to band together and not allow apathy, narcissism. And I'd also say, Rabbi Eric, even ignorance of what the Bible teaches to continue to to just destroy our ability to not only you know give an opinion, but to engage the culture the way that we see laid out in Scripture. And so, yes, Stand Strong America is about looking at the Christian heritage that we have had for so many years in this great country of ours and seeing that this was built because of a, Jude a Judeo-Christian ethic. And the fact that when all my travels, and I know even Dr. Brown, we've talked, and you just had him on the, f the, the show right now, again, together collectively, and why we appreciate your work for, you know, for so many years, is we need to work together to equip these uh, people who are struggling with apathy, who are narcissistic, they just care about their needs, you know, they care about what's on their phones. They care about, you know, what what binging, you know, show they're watching on Netflix kind of thing. And they're neglecting to see what their faith can actually do in the culture today and also ignorance. I mean, we know that this current generation now, Gen Z, is the most biblically illiterate in American history. And you know what the sad thing is, uh, Rabbi, is that we have from 12 percent for baby boomers to 2 percent in some cases now uh, serving people directly in the church. And so that's why we wanted to, this book to, to come out, my colleague Alex and, and, and myself, because we want people to understand what we're missing out on. And, and the, the more they're able to gather insight, the better that they're able to educate people around them. And hopefully, Lord willing, not just protecting, preserving our religious freedoms, but sharing the gospel to people that desperately need to hear it. Throughout history, we have seen there is a common theme, and I have classified it this way, that those who are vocal, who are overrunning, who are gaining ground, are more committed to their sin than the body of Messiah is committed to the Lord. When people say to me that Adolf Hitler was a madman, I say, no, he was not a madman. He was more committed to his sin than the body of Christ was committed to the Lord, and therefore they didn't stand up to him. They acquiesced. As we take a look at the LGBTQ+, the Antifa, the BLM, they are more committed to their sin and to their vision than the body of Messiah is committed to taking a stand for the Lord, and it's through fear and intimidation, and it's because the foundational truths of both America and the Bible are not on the lips of the average American. They cannot tell you the history. They cannot tell you the gospel message. They cannot give you that 1 Peter 3.15 answer for the hope that burned within them. And we've made it so that Christianity has become a spectator sport. And it is a call for us to have full contact with the Holy One of Israel and engage in what we were called to do when we receive this incredible gift. And that gift was the gift of salvation. And with that came the call. And Paul articulates the call that anyone who is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and you have been called into a ministry of reconciliation. So you don't have to go to university. You don't have to get ordained. You have been ordained by God as a believer in Jesus, as a minister of reconciliation, and also promoted to, in the State Department, one of the highest positions of honor is ambassador, a mm -hmm. representative of the United States to the world. And Paul says, you've now been called as an ambassador of God. 
as if God was speaking his own words through you. That means you had to be a member of the State Department, the Kingdom of Heaven. You were God's ambassador on earth. This is a very lofty, very weighty, very important, measured words and actions so that you neither humiliate heaven, you neither grieve the Holy Spirit, you don't embarrass uh, the Lord and his message and the ultimate sacrifice that he made on our behalf. And we just fail to grasp the weight of this incredible charge and gift and have become complacent. And what we're seeing is the foundation is being eroded. In Stand Strong America and in the Stand Strong Ministries that you have formed, you take us back on a journey to our foundation. And I think many are aware of the founding fathers. They've heard enough through the interviews with the Supreme Court uh, nominee about what America was founded on, but it's not personal and it needs to become personal. It's personal for me. My father came from Hungary. Mm -hmm. It's very personal. It's a huge honor. And as a Jewish believer, like Dr. Michael Brown, uh, we had to be willing to count the cost. There was a tangible, palpable cost to us. Rejection by the Jewish community, persecution by the church, persecution by Israel, persecution by the rabbis. Uh, you know how many times he comes under attack. You know how many times I come under attack. We come under attack by our own families and friends and the world at large. Uh, but it seems to be casual that America, you become a Christian because that's the, what you do. It's easy. And uh, you don't have to give your life, but yet God calls you to be willing to. And I don't think people take that seriously. So as we examine the foundation of our country and the dreams of our fathers and the true story of God and country, we see the lives, we see the frontline people, and I think we need that reminder. So take us on a journey and remind us of those that went before us to pave the way for this freedom that we now take for granted and we are on the verge of losing. Yeah, and, and, I, and again, without you and I feel, you know, becoming, you know, depressed individuals, or I always like to, to say to people, becoming like Eeyore, you know, we're just going around moping about everything. And no matter if the sun is shining, you know, things seem to be great, you're, you're always going to find fault to something. That is not obviously the Christian attitude at all. The Bible says to rejoice always again. I say rejoice. And again, we're not to forget in Philippians 4, Paul was writing that when he was in prison, and when he and Silas were in prison together, they're praying as the Psalms told them to pray at midnight, giving honor and glory to the Lord, and he frees them. So having said all that, we understand the issues that we're faced with. I think there's a lot of people, um, Rabbi, that are watching, that listen, that tune in. Uh, they're praying for Israel. They're praying for the local church. They're praying for the body of believers. They're praying for the gospel to spread. They're supporting missionaries around the world. You and I know that one of the major reasons why things are not as bad as you as sometimes we we think they should be is because of the church because of the church body now again god always uses a remnant he's never going to just you know um be using just whatever he wants to do he chooses to use you and me and so there was a period of time in history and it's a beautiful time of history that like you said the schools with the revisionist programs that exist today to rewrite things tear down statues all of these things we saw happen in places, like you said, in some cases in Hungary, when you see it in the former Soviet Union, when you see, of course, with uh, Germany uh, and, and the Gestapo that was going on during that time. And we're seeing it little by little in America. But when you and I go back, we have to remember what the founders believed. And it comes from Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's what they believed. They're not 
They wanted to propagate the gospel message that we see from the Mayflower Compact, et cetera, but they were not proselytizing people to force people in union with Christianity because that's contrary to how the gospel is explicitly taught. Just like a loving relationship between a man and a woman, we know the, the moment someone is forced to love someone against their will, that's contradiction, right? It's like an oxymoron. Forced freedom is an oxymoron. And so when it comes to, to saving grace, as you are mentioning earlier, it's about a new creation. It's about being saved from your sin and death uh, that awaits us. But because of Jesus who came, who atoned for our sins. And so the idea of having a government that protected such rights, and again, these are natural rights, and that's something that I think people are forgetting these days. They think that it's what you decide. They're preferential treatments based on how you want to live. But again, fundamentally, these are natural rights that the founders believed because they believed that there was an absolute standard. There was objective morality. They saw human beings, again, self-evident truths, that each one of us are made in the image of God and we have intrinsic value. So when you see a Declaration of Independence, when you see a Constitution, when you see – I mean one of the things, Rabbi Eric, that I wish people would do more actually is read some of the Federalist Papers. Read some of John Adams' stuff. Read some of Thomas Jefferson things. These were not perfect human beings, but a lot of these guys had – that was congruent, if you will, to uh, maybe not sound theologically entirely, but they had a robust biblical worldview to some extent. Yes, they read people like David Hume, John Locke, and William Blackstone and others. Yes, they were moved by the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, and the life of Moses. And in some cases, they saw some of that reflected within what God was doing divinely, providentially, uh, during the American Revolution. But what we do see, though, is we see a, a, a group of people who believed in limited government because ultimately our first freedom, which is our religious freedom, and you said earlier, it's harder to regain something once it's lost. And for so many years, this great country of ours that has done so many great things around the world, not supporting everything the America has done. You, you, you and I wouldn't do that. There are some things that we disagree with about our country. But who else in this world has advanced – charitable donations, freedom, democracy, giving people the rights to express themselves how they wish, right? Letting them know that there is a God, letting them know that it's not right for a tyranny to rule, uh, but to go against depotism. That's in our blood from the very beginning when they left Holland and they came to the shores of what we now refer to as the United States of America and fought off the king who was forcing people to do things against their wishes. So I think if we just start having more of these conversations and getting back to some of the history and not accepting a revisionist perspective, I think the better off we're going to be. America's foundation is on religious freedom. That was the big issue. I mean, we hear about taxation without representation is tyranny, but... <clears throat> The underlying factor was the Church of England was demanding complete adherence to that as a state religion. And uh, the colonists were opposed, that they wanted to be free, free to believe as they chose to believe, meaning there was room for atheism, there was room for any thought didn't have to be alignment with the Bible or Christianity or Judaism. There was the freedom. That was the ultimate point, was that the government should not have control over your faith system, that that was your personal choice that was given to you by God, who was your creator, and he gave you that choice. <clears throat> and you had the choice to choose and accept or you have the choice to not accept. That was a personal responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> we've now seen in America today, I would say the single greatest violation of the Constitution and of the Revolution is the advancement of a violation of the separation of church and state which says there shall be no state religion, that there actually is the creation and the advancement of a state religion called humanism. 
and it is a religion. And it is one being advocated by our government and by each one of these groups, which is promoting tolerance, exception of every aberration or aberrant behavior, of every kind of thought process, and that falls in the category of secular humanism. And that is now being promoted at the highest levels as being an American way of thought. That is a religion and it is a violation of the Constitution. So we see due to the ignorance, not calling people ignorant, but the ignorance of what the Founding Fathers were saying and being able to call it like we see it and saying whoa, stop, your legislation, your Supreme Court rulings, your enforcement, and your allowing the advancement of those things which support an ideology or a religion <clears throat> that is not based on the Bible, but is based on free will, but we're guiding, leading you, and directing, and legislating you to conform is, in fact, driving towards a, not a separation of church and state. That, to me, is egregious. That, to me, is something that is an undertone that there is now this loud voice that is overshouting the believer's voice saying that if you don't accept all of these, and they're all lumped together, uh, attributes or, or um, conditions of secular humanism, then we're in opposition to you. And that is a revolution. That was the foundation of the American Revolution. <laughs> it's the foundation of the revolution today, but I just don't think people are willing to look at it from that perspective to see that we are engaged in a civil war. Now it's a civil war of ideologies. Yeah, and, and the ideology, again, the further away we are of Scripture, then what does that ideology ideology look like you know and and i think we have to be reminded to your point and i encourage people in the book that's exactly why rabbi eric we uh address this in the book matter of fact i do it in, in my first book i i wrote the raging war of ideas i deal with a whole chapter of what separation of church and state really is and refute the false claim that you said that's been motivated through secular humanism and progressives and chapter three, God and country, the true story, we jump into and understand the term separation of church and state that that uh, never appeared, obviously, in any founding documents. Um, and e even 150 years later, in understanding the, the value of the First Amendment and the establishment of our nations or the one nation with all these independent sovereign states, there was never the intent to have a a nationalized Christian denomination in America. And matter of fact, it was in March 27th of 1854, the House of Representatives, when they said that uh, prior to this, remember this is almost 100 years, 100 years removed uh, from the Bill of Rights, and they said the adoption of the Constitution and the amendments, the, the universal sentiment was that Christianity should be encouraged, but not at uh, it being a one sect denomination. So they are validating the separation now for your listeners to understand, and this is vitally important, again, we're not proselytizing and advancing a Christian nation, but rather a Judeo-Christian ethic, because to your point, if you think about it, if you take out the, the concepts that we have built on natural rights, built on self-governance, built on limited government and not a monarch, right, and you replace it in this case with secular humanism, this ultimately leads to communism. When you take out religious freedom and the conviction one has before their maker, 
and how we ought to live in our society and believe in law and order and and support the three institutions that God has put in place in his creation, in his economy, starting first with Adam and Eve, with the institution of marriage and having them govern over the things of the world. And you see that all the way to chapter 11, what happens when you turn against God, when you abandon God, and yet God's still pursuing man, and yet we continue to do things our way and build our own Tower Babel. And that's what we're seeing today is where I think the apathy and the narcissism and the control of an ideological position of secular humanism is not trying to reach God, but trying to get people to reach them. And it's impossible because elitism, people that are in power are not there to serve the common man. So in, in the situation we're seeing today is we're not seeing true statesmen, true stewards of what God has given. Because when you look at the two, insti- two other institutions, the church and government, notice re- they've, we've already redefined on the judiciary level what marriage is. Because government got involved in marriage a, y- a hundred years prior to all this. Marriage was never to be a government affair, like education. That was supposed to be contained within the home and the church. So we got ourselves in trouble back then when we started to play politics with God's blueprint. And so these are consequences, unfortunately, that we're dealing with. And of course, if you neglect in being involved in your faith with law and order and common sense, the third institution that is government, and we see the limitations that government has in Romans 13, it's to enact justice, it's to protect people. But when we are not preserving those rights and checking the government, it will become too big. In the case of Thomas Hobbes, he refers to it as the Leviathan. And Thomas Jefferson warned the people that when you turn from God and you're depending on government, and the more you rely on government, the more you'll land up bowing to its wishes. And that's what we're seeing, unfortunately. It's obvious that the minority in their cancel culture and their uh, vocal condemnation and intimidation has caused the weakest of the believers, those who may attend church but do nothing more and so the only foundation they have is on the sermon that was given on Sunday and by Tuesday it's forgotten. They have no platform to stand on and therefore they cannot stand up for fear of ridicule and persecution and not wanting to put themselves out there or expose their children to that kind of bullying or intimidation and now you have this really gang mentality that is overrunning the nation by uh, protests which are being supported by the government. There was restrictions placed on gatherings in churches, but no restrictions on these uh, pro- violent protests. Uh, church was considered to be a non-essential service, but a liquor store was considered to be essential. You got the sense from every state because they were the ones that passed this was at the state level uh, that mandated these openings and closings that there was no respect for the house of worship or the family of faith in this narrative and that freedom of speech was in the public forum on the streets uh, was an inalienable right given to us in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Therefore, they had to permit that without violating their First Amendment freedom of speech right. But the institution of the church became now relegated to any other building. And as they regulated businesses and the size of a business, or the open air closing of a business, they looked at it as a business and a gathering of people that could be controlled and they exerted control over it, which was being challenged and 
of course, one was arrested and tried and uh, took it to the courts. Uh, it is a collective mentality by the existing government that's in place that the church's role uh, is as a faith component but not a values or a foundational component to the American way. And that is an abrogation of the founding fathers and the pillars in which America was founded on. We're talking with Jason Jimenez, author of the new book, Stand Strong America, Courage, Freedom, and Hope for Tomorrow. Uh, the current situation demands that we examine, first of all, our knowledge and our awareness that we have become a nation that's hysterical and we're supposed to be historical. And we have replaced history with hysteria. And we have become ill-equipped to stand up against the assault because we don't know our own history. I have sitting next to me two documents that never leave my side the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States and uh, the Bill of Rights and uh, the Amendments. Sitting right here, right next to my Bible. These are the documents in which I stand on in our position here on revealing the truth. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to talk about the courts, Christianity, a, call, a clarion call to wake up church, the role you play in restoring America to, to, to its true greatness, and the call for you to take a stand. We'll be right back with Jason Amenez after these messages. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black, and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Canaan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again.
Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Jason Amanis, who, along with Alex McFarland, have written Stand Strong America, Courage, Freedom, and Hope for Tomorrow. You can find out more about them at StandStrongMinistries.org. Jason, welcome back. Thank you. So the courts in Christianity, jumping to the 10th chapter of your book, um, this is um, an issue that, that we're facing in this confirmation hearing that's becoming very evident that the liberal view American government is that they want to empower the judiciary to create legislation. When we look at 1973 Roe v. Wade, there is no law, there's no legislation tied to that decision. There's no law in America. And this really became legislative in its decision in favor of Roe v. Wade. Wait. The 2015 redefinition of marriage was legislation that belonged at the state level, adjudicated in a court system, and then applied as legislation much to the joy of those that would like to see the judiciary, the court, insinuate in itself into becoming a quasi-legislative branch, relieving the legislative branch of having the political wars and that they have and saying, well, hey, they said it's legal. We don't have to have a law. They say it's legal, so you can do it. How are we seeing that play out when it comes to Christianity? Well, to your point, and, and just so your listeners and watchers understand, in the judiciary branch, it's very vital that it's not an imperial one. And so that's why we do lifetime judges, and that's why this whole case about packing the court is a big deal because it becomes obsolete. And what a progressive mindset wants to have that is not again there's two forms there's the originalist and there's the textualist you know so what the original tent was in the text to your point about what a judge on the high court the supreme court okay so a scotus judge is not to is to interpret as best they can to the original intent of what the founders intended not letting not setting a precedent that is in a gray area and so that's a thorough rendering, not legislative interpreting. We have now gotten to a place where it's all about legislating things. So we're legislating marriage, redefining in the process. Just recently, again, Rabbi, as many people know, when you look at what just had ha happened two months ago, and when you had the majority in SCOTUS, they saw – the 1964, the Lyndon Johnson bill that, was, that, of course, you know, Kennedy, before he was assassinated, was trying to, you know, put through the civil rights movement with the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act. Well, Johnson becomes president and he gets it pushed through. That's still one of his biggest successes, even though that was not on his, you know, his agenda and he didn't want to pass it uh, for reasons we can get into later. But the point being is that now that 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 act, that legislation is now interpreting what sexual orientation is today going back again to the 14th amendment rendering that goes back to Roe v. Wade and how they're viewing today's terminology to fit the text if, you know, when the founders drafted the constitution and of course when they ratified it to now what you're seeing from the Everson and Board of Education in 1947 to see 1973 with Roe v. Wade in 2015 with Ogreville. And so now you're even saying with sexual orientation, that is major uh, legislation because you are now giving special rights to a particular group 
that will infringe even though the majority of people will not intentionally within that community that identify them with some sexual orientation but they'll take that special privilege again it only takes a small majority and the high court gave them these rights because that's how they legislated because that was their quote unquote interpretation but we would say that was their rendering and that will undermine the first and most important freedom of all and that's religious freedom so yes this will have major ramifications in courts uh, in the next uh, several years what's so interesting about this is this parallels the rightful interpretation of scripture and uh, the rightful interpretation of scripture requires that you read it in context first of all you read what the writer wrote to the audience that he was writing and the intent in the message before you can then if you don't understand it in context you cannot then apply it to today and apply 21st century application to it unless you understand the contextual and textual nature of what the writer was conveying at the time. This is that's why some of the universality of Paul's letters and certain passages of Paul's letters have become universal in the fact that they've created doctrine based on a single statement directed to a specific offending party. And they said, oh, well, he said women can't talk. So psh, now you have whole denominations where women have, you know, he was talking to these two women that were troublemakers, and, but specifically to them. And so if you have troublemakers in your congregation and they happen to women, then you need to deal with that. But as far as a universal doctrine is concerned, you can't take it out of context. And this is what we charge the Supreme Court with is in not doing that. And there are ramifications to doing so which have a global effect. So it then begs the question, what role does the church play as the Black Robe Regiment was the strongest voice in directing the colonists to understand and interpret for them what the agenda of Britain was in trying to impose this on us and to equip them to rise up and say, no, we're not going to allow this. What, uh, and, and because the mis application of the 501c3 implications, which there's never been a court case trying anyone on a violation of the nonprofit laws of a 501c3 corporation, uh, there's been this fear that you should not. Uh, but the Bible was highly political, highly commentary on government, highly commentary on justice, highly uh, verbal and vocal on um, uh, clear delineations between right and wrong, good and evil, light and dark, uh, what was moral, what was immoral. Uh, is the church asleep? And are they more concerned about filling pews and building buildings than they are about impacting uh, what will, it's, it's just like God says, the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. Uh, if a new president comes into office with a new agenda and new legislation, that's going to apply to Christians and non-Christians equally. So what should the role of the church be in standing up for a message of addressing uh, how we should stand strong? That's a great question. You know, again, as we are in a presidential, you know, election cycle here in 2020, and it's unfortunate, and I'm sure you get you get the, the same disappointment and letdown when you start seeing Christians speaking up every four years as though like, hey, where have they been the last, you know, three some odd years before a next presidential cycle? Because they don't like the the person or the or pretend, like I hear a lot of Christians all of a sudden they're all afraid of Marxism now if, if Biden gets elected type thing, and you don't hear from them, you know during the rest of the year, right? Because all is normal. 
I, obviously we're, we're in this new normal with COVID right now. Um, and that's unfortunate. So what I would say to those type of people, including people, again, who are diehard or passionate, committed to, again, as you say, igniting a nation through the power of the Holy Spirit and God's truth, is we cannot, we cannot make the president or our House of Representatives, even though they represent us and they're supposed to be pursuing the agenda, um, and I use a term loosely, of what their constituents want in their district that we have a voice. We can't force them to obey God's principles. So what do we do? While well, we live out God's teachings in our own lives, and as as we said earlier, and it goes, we keep going back to it, we go back to the Bible, and we know that less than 20% of Christians read the Bible daily. And that's even in that percentage, when you survey them even greater, you find that most of these people have never been discipled, and they're not studying the Bible and pro with proper hermeneutics. They don't have the proper tools to do it. So they may be reading the Bible, but it's more of a devotional. So I would say for Christians listening that we need to be emboldened in God's word. We need to learn what the Bible teaches and we need to learn how to live it out. We are to um, offer evidence of God's word to be true to people's lives. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, that we're to let our, sh our light shine before people that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. So one of the things that I'm always blown away that we still see in this great country of ours is the giving heart of many Christians who go out there to meet the needs of people. And we talk a lot about these essential workers. A lot of these essential workers are people of faith. And they go because they're going where Jesus called us to go, despite risking their own lives or their own well-being one of the things when I've studied a lot of American history through the years, um, and it's been a hobby of mine for so long, is I have been blown away by the level of sacrifice that many of our founders went through, sacrificing their land, sacrificing, sacrificing their well-being, sacrificing their own lives because they became a traitor to the king when they declared independence as colonies against the king. That's what it took to fight for freedom. And it's gonna, there's gonna be casualties in the midst. But the question is, who's willing to risk their lives for something far greater than our pleasures of today? And so our work and our words combined with a powerful witness that I care enough for people's souls and if they're gonna be in eternal damnation or in eternal glory, that will radically change the landscape beyond, far beyond Who's the next Supreme Court justice? Who's the next president? What matters the most in God's economy and for all eternity is that you and I are glorifying our Father, that we are demonstrating what a Christian looks like, explicitly living out the gospel and teaching it without being afraid. And you're right. When you're afraid and you let Satan enter in there, he, he doesn't want the gospel to be preached. He may give a false gospel, and you and I are getting plenty of that these days. There's a lot of false teachers out there. I was just teaching my kids last night in Acts chapter 8. We are talking after dinner. You can't buy the Holy Spirit's power. And thankfully for John and Peter who are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and the Jerusalem council, these godly messianic Jews, right? They sent Peter and John, two great apostles, to authenticate what Philip the evangelist was doing because even Samaritans were coming to faith. And you had a false teacher amongst them who was baptized, who was pretending to be one of them. And then when it came to seeing something that he never seen before, he thought he could purchase it. And Peter rebuked him of his wickedness. I do believe, and I know people may feel uncomfortable saying when I say this, but there has to be correcting and there has to be rebuking in the church not just in terms of the apathy and the narcissism and the ignorance that we're seeing, but the, the utter disappointing preaching or lack thereof of God's word in the lives of people. If you, and I, if you and I are not living the teachings of Jesus out because we don't know it, then we will live a contrary life that God opposes. And that's why people like us who are shepherds, according to Acts 20 verse 28, we need to pay close attention to ourselves and the people that are among us, and we need to fight against the ferocious wolves. 
Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Jason Amanis, author of the new book, Stand Strong America, Courage, Freedom, and Hope for Tomorrow. You can find out more at standstrongministries.org. Jason, don't let it be so long in between the times that we talk. And uh, you are always welcome back. It was great to see you again, catch up with you. We are proud of the work that you are doing and the challenges that you lay before us. I know these next two weeks are going to be uh, challenging for us both as we uh, await the results, but our faith is not in America. We are not electing a pastor in chief and the Lord has not changed. And therefore our mandate doesn't change by who God appoints and all leadership has God appointed. So we have to trust in the fact that the Lord's plan will unfold. We're not going to rest on the uh, prophesiers or the prophet liars and tell us that there's uh, this is the end of the world and that this is the uh, bold judgments being poured out on us and the pestilence. We're just going to take it one day at a time and stand on the truth of the word of God until God reveals to us at his time and his place, we'll all find out at the same time. God bless you, my friend. Give our God best to you. Alex and uh, your family, and I hope to see you again soon. God bless you. Thank you for the time. It was good seeing you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.